Okay, guys, let's get started without any further ado. I guess everyone is here. So before we do so, a quick formal introduction on my, my name is Mohamed Shwal. Oh, one second. Yeah. So as I was saying, my name is Mohamed Shwal, I'm a cybersecurity trainer, certified from the same organization called EC Council, one of the leading organizations for trainings and certifications in the domain of cybersecurity based in the United States. And again, this is a, again when you get into cybersecurity, a lot of organizations try to figure out which company you have learned cybersecurity from. And EC comes is one of the leading organizations for trainings in it. Okay. So the rest of follows the same exact curriculum that EC Council teaches as well. Okay. We'll be learning the same exact topics from the main organization. Okay. Now when you talk about Hacking or ethical hacking. A lot of students have a misconception that they are one and the same though. Okay, but we all know hacking is something which is very criminal or very, uh, I would say, uh, uh, a wrong uh, job, a criminalistic or an offensive job. Okay, then why do we have a course called ethical hacking? And how is this getting ethical in the first place? Okay, so let's start the demo with the definitions of each of these terms. What is hacking and what is ethical hacking? Okay. So when you talk about hacking, guys, this is the procedure of trying to gain access to information systems. Now, what I mean by that phrase, gaining access to information systems, is if I were a hacker, and let's say if I hacked into your network, it basically means I have complete remote connection of your network. So whatever devices you might have in your network, your phones, your routers, your smart, uh, again, your smart TVs or your laptops or databases or whatever it be, I have complete remote connection to those devices. And I can access the data on them. I can steal your data or destroy your data. And all of this is done without your permission and without your knowledge. So that is what hacking is. Procedure of trying to gain access to information systems without the permission and knowledge of the organization owning those systems. And why do hackers perform this? Sometimes for their own benefit or sometimes just for fun. Okay, so once they've gotten access to your data, they can steal, uh, once they've stolen your data, they can sell it to other people or they can destroy it on your system. Okay. And again, again, utilize or leak that information to other organizations as well. Okay. So that is what hacking is about. If hacking is such a criminal activity, if it is such a malicious activity, why do we have a course called ethical hacking? And how is this getting ethical or legal in the first place? To define ethical hacking, on the other hand, this is the procedure of trying to find vulnerabilities. So this term called vulnerability is something that will keep coming across a lot of times in the upcoming days as well. To define it, a vulnerability is a loophole. It's a flaw. It's a weakness in the system. So your job in ethical hacking is to find these weaknesses, these loopholes in the information systems. And this is done with the consent and with the knowledge of the organization. So you work hand in hand with the organization, uh, again, uh, uh, following all the policies or the rules that the organization sets without crossing any lines or without crossing any boundaries. Okay. And you try to find the loopholes. Once the loopholes are found in the systems, you report it back to the company so that they can patch it up. Because these are the same loopholes which the hackers take advantage of to get access to your data. So your job in ethical hacking is to find the loopholes first and remediate them. Remediate in the sense, patch them up. Okay. And once the loopholes have been patched, you're preventing any hacker from causing any further harm or cyber threats. Okay, so you're protecting the organization from the hackers in ethical hacking. Okay, is that clear? Everyone, any questions, any doubts up to this point? Vishwaji, uh, Vishwamitra, Faisal, Pavani, Palak, Rashid, yes, yes. Harshad. Right. It's clear, it's if you want to make a note also, you can, guys. If not, I can progress. Uh, again, I can go to the next slide. Do let me know. Is anyone taking a note or something? Okay, I'll just wait for a minute if you're making a note and I'll progress to the next slide. So hacking is, as mentioned earlier, basically trying to get access to the remote systems without the permission or the consent of the organization. Ethical hacking is finding the loopholes which the hackers are utilizing to get that connection and patching up those loopholes or removing those loopholes. Okay, so, oh yeah, sure, take a note, no problem. No rush, Harshad, you can take a note.
right so now let's progress further so depending on these two definitions guys of hacking and ethical hacking we can categorize the types of hackers as well and there are three main categories there's someone known as a white hat hacker there's someone known as a gray hat hacker and then there's someone known as a black hat hacker now when you talk about black hat hackers first these are people who perform hacking for their own benefit okay or even just for fun without asking for consent okay so basically these people can also commonly be called as cyber criminals people who perform cyber threats on organizations steal their data or destroy their data now these are the bad guys on the internet to protect against these bad guys we have someone called as white hat hackers okay white hat hackers are people who abide by the laws and policies of the organization and they work hand in hand with the organization to secure it okay and prevent these cyber threat attacks and they are also commonly known as uh, white hat hackers or ethical hackers and in between there's a third category called gray hat hackers now these people have both the qualities of a black hat hacker as well as a white hat hacker so like a black hat hacker they don't ask for permission first but once they do find the vulnerability they report it back to the company but they definitely will not be doing it for free there's a minor catch here they would do it in return for a bounty a bounty is like a financial reward they expect in return to report the vulnerability to the co company okay so they are working for the company but for def for definitely a small amount of price okay so they would report the vulnerabilities back to the organization in return for a bounty in return for a financial reward so therefore they are working both offensively like a black hat hacker and defensively like a white hat hacker at various stages hence the name gray hat hacker a mixture of the qualities of both categories these are also commonly known as freelance hackers or bug bounty hunters they hunt for bugs in companies or in websites in return for a bounty okay now no matter what category of a hacker you take whether it be a black hat hacker a gray hat hacker or a white hat hacker they perform hacking or ethical hacking in a certain uh, uh, i would say in a certain procedure and that procedure is commonly called as cyber kill chain some organizations also refer to it as hacking cycle so it's one and the same terminology okay to define it hacking cycle or the cyber kill chain is a procedure that is followed by hackers to perform a successful cyber attack and the same procedures knowledge also allows cyber security professionals or ethical hackers to understand how these attacks are being performed to detect them at an early stage and to prevent them from causing any further harm or any harm at all at every level of the organization okay so you can make a note of this guys okay so again the procedure that is used by hackers to perform an attack or the procedure used by ethical hackers to prevent such same certain attacks okay at every level of the organization and again prevent any harm at the organization that's called as cyber kill chain okay and the cyber kill chain contains five important steps i'll discuss that now do let me know once the note taking is done and i'll progress to the next slide Perfect. Now, as mentioned earlier, guys, this cyber kill chain or hacking cycle contains five important steps. Let me list them out first, and then we'll talk about each of these steps briefly so you understand the content of the course. Okay. So the first step is commonly known as information gathering. Second step is called as scanning. Third step is called as gaining access. Fourth step is called as maintaining access, and the last step is called as reporting or clearing cases. Now, over here, if you carefully observe. in the last step i have mentioned two different terminologies reporting or clearing cases all the others are only sing one singular phrases okay but the last one has two possibilities so what i mean to indicate by that is no matter what category of a hacker you are whether you be a white hat hacker a gray hat hacker or a black hat hacker first four steps are exactly identical there is no change in the procedure in the first four steps what varies is only the end result if you are a white hat hacker or a gray hat hacker what you do is you report the vulnerabilities back to the organization so you generate a report 
elaborate all the loopholes or the vulnerabilities in the organization and provide solutions as well. On the other hand, if you're a black hat hacker, you don't report anything. What you try to do is you try to remove the evidences. Okay, You try to stay anonymous. You try to delete all the uh, logs of the operations you've performed. And that in simple terms is called as clearing traces. Okay, And that is what differs in the last step, whether you're a hacker or an ethical hacker. Okay, Let's briefly talk about each of these steps one by one now. So the first step is called as information gathering. Some companies also refer to it as a reconnaissance of footprinting. And main objective of this phase is the hacker or the ethical hacker tries to gather as much information or data as possible about the target organization. And this information is obtained passively. What I mean by passively is you do not contact the organization in any way. You don't let the organization know that you're retrieving information about them and get this information from third party sources especially from certain websites on the internet. So there's certain gold mines of information on the internet, some certain websites from where you can get all the data required. Okay, and those are called as reconnaissance websites. We'll talk about them practically in our upcoming sessions. Okay, but this phase involves the hacker or the ethical hacker getting information about the organization from third party sources, from the other websites on the internet. But the main question that arises here is what kind of information are we looking for? And that information is as follows. So when you're trying to perform a hacking activity or an ethical hacking, I mean, a, a ethical hacking uh, penetration test on an organization, you need all these pieces of information for that. IP addresses of the organization, network blocks, network block in the sense, the group of IPs belonging to that organization or the who's records, who's hosting the website for them, DNS server records, domains of the organization, subdomains of the organization, operating system information, what OS are they running it on? Are they running Windows servers? Are they running Linux servers? Employee details, contact numbers of the employees, email addresses of the employees, okay? And usernames and passwords. If any of the usernames and passwords were leaked online in the earlier data breaches, you need to get that information as well. So believe it or not, all of this information is readily available on the internet. The only thing is you need to know where you can obtain it from, okay? So again, I'll show you a small practical as well. So let's say if I wanted to get the DNS records for any organization. Now, basically DNS records are in the sense every organization contains a DNS server. Okay. And that server maintains information on what websites belong to the organization. And for those websites, what are the exact IP addresses, the identity for the servers of those uh, web servers, okay, for those websites. So again, that information is stored in something called DNS records. And if I wanted the DNS records for any company, I can just go to my browser and in my browser here, I can simply search for DNS dumpster, a very popular website, I would say, in the cybersecurity circle, provides you the DNS records for any organization. So if I take the example of, let's say, netflix.com, I can just search here, netflix.com. And now this starts showing me the complete DNS records of Netflix. Firstly, where the Netflix server is located, in which country or in which part of the world are the servers located in? How many DNS servers does Netflix have? So right now, Netflix has one primary DNS server and three secondary DNS servers. And these are the exact IP addresses of the servers. These IPs are very crucial for a hacker or an ethical hacker to perform the upcoming stages of attacks. On these IPs itself, you perform the attacks. So these are the four DNS servers. And in these servers, you have all these other records. So MX records indicates mail server records. So how many mail servers does Netflix have? Netflix right now is working on five mail servers. So these are the servers through which all the mails, uh, again, emails, notifications, or whatever it be, are passed through. Okay. So these are the five mail servers of Netflix. Scroll down much further. These are the host records, giving information on the web main web server and all the other servers belong to Netflix as well, the other subdomains, okay? So this is the main domain, netflix.com. These are all the subdomains of Netflix and their exact IP addresses. So these are very crucial for a hacker or an ethical hacker because on these IPs itself, he performs the upcoming attacks, okay? So again, all of this information for Netflix is provided over here in this one single website. So this is about the DNS records guys. Similarly, for other pieces of information, we have other websites. We'll cover those in the upcoming sessions. Okay. Any questions, any doubts up to this point? Anyone? Vishwamitra, Harshad, Faisal, 
पलक रश्मि ओके नोट यू कैन मेक अ नोट गाइस एंड इफ यू वांट मी टू प्रोग्रेस आई कैन प्रोग्रेस टू द नेक्स्ट स्लाइड Okay. Shall I progress, guys, to the next slide? Uh, I hope everyone's taken a note. Again, uh, just to let you know, all of these sessions are being recorded, guys. So uh, again, you will be getting these recordings on your email directly. But since these are demos, they might be uploaded on YouTube itself. The first two three classes will be on YouTube, and after that. from the uh, from the registered sessions all the uh, other recordings will be sent directly to your email okay if the information is so crucial then why is it made available online good question harshit so again the information needs to be made online because there are multiple clients who need to connect on those servers until they know what domains are hosted and what ips they are hosted on we would not know how to connect on them so the it, uh, the issue here is not with you giving out this information the issue here is with the organization not checking if all the servers are secure or not there is no chance of where you cannot give out this information you need to so that the people can connect to your services or connect to your websites but whatever websites you are hosting those should not contain any vulnerabilities so whatever domains are hosted on these ips whatever sub domains are hosted on these ips it's the responsibility of the organization to see to it that these sub domains do not have a vulnerability on them even if you are giving the uh, address so it's basically like you giving uh, your house is visible to everyone everyone knows where your house is on the street every passer by knows that but you just cannot leave your house unlocked when you're not at your house okay so your house needs to have a gate it needs to have the proper security so that even if it is visible to everyone no one enters it and breaks into it okay same logic okay you need to give out your information you cannot stop from giving out but whatever information is being given out that needs to be secure so that it, it cannot be hacked Okay, for public access, it needs to be given out. Is that clear, Ashwin? Yes, sir. Right. Moving forward. So once this information is obtained from here, from these passive methods, then comes the next phase, which is called as scanning. So this is also commonly known as enumeration. So some companies call it as enumeration, and the main objective here is we try to get some extra information on the target, but by making active and aggressive connection. Now you might have a question. we already performed information gathering what is getting extra information now so again guys what information we got in the earlier phase was just passive okay and that's not the complete picture there some information can only be obtained by making active connections active in the sense so whatever ips you have obtained here in the earlier phase you now try to use some tools and send some packets on these ips and from that you get some extra data okay and depending on what data you're getting you can divide scanning in three parts there's something called as network scanning port scanning and vulnerability scanning but the important point to note here is you make active and aggressive connections so you make direct contact with the servers of the organization and get information from them so here in this phase the organization gets to know that someone is trying to get information about them in the earlier phase organization has no clue this is just a third party website on dns again dns dumpster no way linked to netflix.com so when i'm trying to obtain this information netflix doesn't get that data but when i try to connect on these servers of netflix they will definitely know that someone is trying to get information about them okay but again <clears throat> as mentioned it's a crucial phase and from the scan we get three pieces of information let's just get some water guys give me one minute i will be right short for some reason
Yeah, I'm back. Sorry about that. So as mentioned, guys, there are three parts of scanning. There's something called as network scanning, boot scanning, and vulnerability scanning. In network scanning, we try to figure out in the local organization. So if there's an organization for Netflix or headquarters, let's say, in that organization, what all devices are connected? So in their network, what devices exist? How many routers do they have? How many firewalls do they have? How many local servers do they have? How many mail servers do they have? DNS servers do they have? How many web servers or DHCP servers? How many uh, security devices do they have? IDS, IDS protection devices, intrusion detection systems or intrusion prevention systems. So getting a network topology of their internal infrastructure is called as network scanning. Getting to know what all active devices are there in their local network. Once you know what devices are available, on those devices, you perform something called port scanning. So every device has something called logical ports. And on those ports, multiple applications or services are run. So your job in port scanning is to figure out what ports are open. And on those ports, what services or what applications are running. And once you know what services or applications are running, finally, you perform vulnerability scanning to figure out on those services, what service contains a loophole to attack on. Okay, so it's a step-by-step -step procedure. Finding the devices first, in the devices, finding what services are running. On those services, is there any weak service or vulnerable service to attack on? Okay. And during this phase, we'll be using two very important tools phase. One tool is called as Nmap. Again, a very popular tool. Been there since 1997, actually. So very old tool, but still used in the latest of applications as well. Completely open source and free to use as well. Used for network scanning and port scanning. Okay. And then there's one more tool called Tenable Nessus. Complete opposite, very expensive tool. So if you click on the first link here, you can notice it is around $6,000 or $7,000, I, I remember. Yeah, for one year subscription that too. So every year to use this tool, the company needs to pay $7,000 US dollars. And that in Indian currency is like 5 lakh 86,000 rupees. Okay. But I mean, don't worry. Luckily, we have a trial version for this and I'll practically show you how to run this tool and how to find vulnerabilities automatically in an organization. So this is an automated vulnerability form. So no matter what devices might exist in your organization, it scans each and every endpoint and tells you what misconfigurations are there or what vulnerabilities are there in those devices automatically. And it generates a report as well. But the job doesn't end there. Once a report is generated, on that report, you need to perform manual testing again. Verify if the report is giving you correct results or complete results or not. Okay, so that is called as manual vulnerability assessment. So after this is done, we perform that operation. Okay, but again, this is giving you a glimpse of what tools we'll be using. <clears throat> for network scanning, we use Nmap for port scanning as well. And for vulnerability scan, we go with a tool called Nessus over here. Okay, so these are the tools we'll be using in this certain phase. Now, once we have obtained all the pieces of information, next phase is nothing but gain access. The phase where the real hacking occurs and where things get interesting, okay? So again, attackers use the vulnerabilities found in the earlier phases. Now, to get access to the system or the application or the complete network, okay? So if, uh, again, any questions or doubts up to this point, anyone? Vishwamitra, Harshad, Faisal, Pavani, Palak. Clear, sir. Everything is clear. Right. Now, moving forward, so once all the information has been obtained up to this phase, then we move into the next part called gaining access. One of the most important modules, I would say, covers a vast variety of topics as well, as you can notice. Okay. And this is, again, some of the most important ones that we will be learning throughout the course. So let me explain each of these one by one. Now. So the first topic we learn is system hacking. So every organization has a Windows server or a Windows client operating system. So we learn if the system is locked, how do you crack or bypass the password of that operating system. Now you might, uh, this might sound very offensive or very uh, criminal activity, but there might be scenarios where your own system gets hacked and you're locked out of your own device. In such a scenario, you need to know how can you get back your data? How can you log in back to your system? So we learn how to crack the password of any Windows operating system. And if it is too tough to crack, if it is too strong of a password to crack, how do you bypass the password without even entering the password? How do you get access back to your data? is what we learn in system hacking. Then comes malware attacks. 90% of your cyber threats occur through malware. Malware is a word joined by two other words, malicious software. So any software which performs a malicious activity or harmful activity on your system is called as a malware. 
and there's tons and tons of categories of malware. There's viruses, worms, trojans, spyware, rootkit, whatnot. We'll practically learn how to create each of these malwares, how to defend our system from malwares, and how to detect them if they are already installed on our system without our knowledge. Okay. Then there's a bonus concept called Malware's Advanced. So again, I won't be teaching this. I'll be providing the resources for it, where you can learn how to create your own malware if you have knowledge on Python. Again, please note, for this course, guys, there is no requirement for any programming language. This is just a bonus topic for you, an advanced course, which I'll be sharing the resources for. If you want to learn Python, and if you want to learn Python and how to create Malware's with Python. Again, not the uh, none, none of the other organizations or institutes are providing this resource. So this is actually another advanced course, which I'll be sharing the resources for. Okay, just a bonus concept. Then comes network penetration testing, where we learn the commonly known attacks on networks. So there's attacks like sniffing attack, man in the middle attack, denial of service attack, hacking Wi-Fi routers, cracking the path of Wi-Fi routers. All these attacks belong to network attacks. So we'll be learning these practically. So to, again, give you a brief glimpse on what they are, Sniffing or man in the middle is where if you're in a network and if you're the hacker, you can actually capture the data of other users in the network. So let's say if I'm connected to your home Wi-Fi, if I'm one of the users in your own home Wi-Fi network, I can actually see what data is traveling from each of your devices in the network. Okay. And if possible, I can also capture your data. That is called as MITM. Your usernames and passwords can be captured by me. I can read your credentials. So that is MITM. Denial of service attack is where hackers can send huge amounts of traffic to a server and shut down that server. So if there's flipkart.com or amazon.com, I can now create artificial traffic. I can send such huge amounts of traffic to the server that it can crash. Okay, that is called as a denial of service attack. Okay. And then hacking wireless networks, again, you can figure it out from the name itself. We learn how to crack the Wi-Fi passwords of routers. Okay. Then comes social engineering attacks where we learn how do hackers perform phishing activities, phishing websites, they create fake websites. So if you have a bank login page, a social media login page, they'll create an exact replica of that website and they send that to the victim and they try to fool the victim into getting out the credentials from them. And if the user believes that page and if he enters the credentials, they go directly to the attacker. So we'll learn how to hackers perform those fake activities or fake phishing attacks. And we'll also learn how to distinguish. So if you have a page and if you want to figure out if this is secure or not, We'll learn that as well. How do you distinguish between a genuine page and a fake page? What are the key factors to look for to distinguish between a phishing page and a genuine website? Okay. Then comes hacking web servers. Now, every organization has web servers okay, on which websites are hosted. So we learn what are the misconfigurations that could possibly exist on a web server. How do you attack a web server from the back end? Okay. Now, not only from the back end, we need to learn front end testing as well. So on a web server, you have websites or web applications. And we learn vulnerabilities on those as well in the topic web application pen testing. So there's a few commonly known vulnerabilities like SQL injection, cross-site scripting, broken authentication, file upload vulnerability, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll practically learn how do you find these vulnerabilities in websites and utilize them to get access to crucial or credential information from websites as well. SQL injection is where you can inject malicious SQL queries and get access to the database or get uh, admin access without the password also. Cross-site scripting is where you can inject some JavaScript code into a web page and perform unwanted actions. Okay, Again, defacing the website, shutting down the website completely. All that is possible with cross-site scripting. Broken authentication is where websites have cookies. I'll explain that later on what cookies are. But using those cookies, you can log into other sessions, other people's accounts and perform their activities. Okay. File upload vulnerabilities where you can upload malicious files to a server and get complete remote connection to the server, or complete remote admin access to the server. As well. So again, all of these are website attacks, guys. We'll discuss these in the upcoming sessions practically. Okay. If I had to show you a simple demo for this, basically. So let's say if I wanted to get, again, let me show you a simple SQL injection practical. So I'll just search for some login pages here. login.php public school, central board, mm, all time cargo, central council. Okay, so let's assume I've got some pages here, guys. So you can see this is some uh, PSSamana.org.in, public college Samana. I'm not sure if this is vulnerable or not, but now what I'll do is I'll inject a malicious SQL query here. Now, don't worry what this means. I'll explain that later on. 
Okay, but I'm just trying to inject a malicious SQL query over here. So again, it did not work here. So this page might be secure. Okay, or I can just try some advanced payloads as well. But now I don't have the time to do so. Let me go to other websites. So there's one more here, cbhedelhi.com. Not sure what that website is. Control C, Control V. Oh, this is Central Board for Higher Education Delhi. Uh, okay, so this is the Education Board for India, frankly speaking. But over here, if I go to this login page, so there's a login page here. Let me try it out here. Ash. And again, this is a malicious SQL query, guys. So SQL injection in the sense, hackers try to inject malicious SQL queries. And if the page is accepting it, you can notice I've got admin access here. I'm now logged into the page as the admin account in the central board of higher education in India. This page is vulnerable to this attack. Okay. And if I click on 12th results, if I click on browse, oh, let me click on show data, select class, let's say 12th class, let's say April session, and let's say last year, 2023, show results. And you can see I've got the data for all the students here. Rekha Kumari, daughter of Nahar Singh, mother Sunari Devi, district Agra. How much did she score? Oh, I think she failed. My bad. Bhagat Singh, son of so-and-so person, got 486 marks. So this is the data of all the students from Central Board. And again, if you notice, I have actual admin access here. Okay. I did not know the username or the password for the admin, but I just entered a malicious SQL query and I got remote connection here. So that is how dangerous these SQL injection attacks or web application attacks are. And we'll practically learn what these attacks are, how do these attacks get performed in real time, what this query actually means. Okay, so when I enter this, if I go back, so I entered something like single quote or one equal to one hash. So this is a malicious SQL payload. So I'll practically teach you what this payload means, how is this working, what is the logic behind this payload and how this is giving you admin access and all that. We'll talk about that practically in the upcoming sessions. But just a demo to show you what this can do. And, and, and again, I've showed you this on a real-time web page, something belonging to the Central Board of Higher Education, Delhi, an actual genuine page belonging to the country of India. Okay. So yeah, that's a drawback, I would say. They should have been more careful. But anyways, moving forward. So after that, we have evading techniques. So every organization has some security policies and security devices, intrusion detection systems, intrusion prevention systems, and firewalls. So we'll practically learn how to test the security of it. Sir, it will be manual or will go with burp suit or both. Uh, again, we'll learn. Uh, again, uh, we will. I'll teaching. I'll be teaching burp suit as well, Harshit. But again, more importantly, we'll be focusing on the manual part compared to the automated part in this course, manual pen testing. Okay. But I might show you how to perform automated as well. So this is actually altogether a different course, Harshit. Web application pen testing. Some of the vulnerabilities from that are available in CEH. Okay. So for more advanced testing and all, you there, there's a separate course called web application pen testing. I teach that privately to students who are interested after CEH is done. So if you need more information, you can contact separately. Okay. But most of the manual testing will be done in this, this course. Automated. We might, might not cover much okay, for web pen testing. But yeah, I'll be showing a glimpse of it as well. Is that clear, Ashwin? Yes, sir. Right. Moving forward, as mentioned, so every organization has some security devices as well. We'll learn how to find misconfigurations on those devices. So if there's firewalls, intrusion detection systems, intrusion prevention systems, how do you check if they're secure or not? How do you check if they have any misconfigurations or not? Is what we learn in this evading technique. Then comes vulnerability assessment. So once you know that this tool in SS is providing a report of all the loopholes, now on that report, you perform manual testing. And for that, we use a tool called Metasploit Framework, one of the most important tools in cybersecurity. So you practically learn how do you find vulnerabilities? And again, if there is a vulnerability, how do you attack on it using the Metasploit Framework? Okay, so this is the framework to perform the penetration test, to perform the testing activity. Okay, finally comes hacking mobile phones where we learn if there is an Android phone, how do you send Trojans to an Android phone? and get remote connections to Android phones as well without the user knowledge, okay? So if you carefully observe here, we're covering the security of every single endpoint. We talk about system security, we talk about network security, we talk about wireless security, we talk about web server security, 
we talk about web application security, we talk about firewall security, and as small as a mobile phone as well. So from as small as a mobile phone to as big as a web server or a database, we cover how to check the security on each of these devices. And that's the main objective of this course, finding vulnerabilities in each and every endpoint in an organization. So once all the vulnerabilities have been found, then comes the last two phases, maintaining access and reporting or clearing cases. So maintaining access is where once you've gotten a remote connection to a system, so let's say if I've hacked your phone or your personal computer or whatever it is, I need to maintain my connection with that device now, which means even if you restart your system or shut it down and start it after a very long time also, I should still be connected to you. So that is called as maintaining access. So hackers try to retain the ownership of the target. Okay, And with that, they can also perform other operations as well. So from your system, I can attack other systems in your network. That is called as post-exploitation task. Okay, So after the exploitation is done, after that, what you perform is called post-exploitation. Okay, From your system, anchoring other devices, pivoting and getting access to other devices in your network, Okay, creating multiple backdoors, all that is post-exploitation. Okay. And finally, after that, we have reporting or clearing traces where we learn as an ethical hacker, once you've found all the loopholes, how do you generate a report and elaborate the vulnerabilities and the solutions to the organization? That's reporting. And clearing traces as well, as a non-ethical hacker, as a black hat hacker, how do they remove the footprints? How do they delete the logs and erase the evidence and stay anonymous? So the course is going to run in two simple tracks. How do you perform the attacks first? And how do you defend these attacks as an ethical hacker? Okay. And again, as mentioned, guys, everything is going to be a very practical session. First few classes where we talk about prerequisites, networking fundamentals, Linux basics, these might be somewhat theory, but after the basics are covered, every single topic I show will be very practically implemented. Okay. So to show you the entire course content, so in, our, in my demo, I could not show the entire course content, but here is the document for it. Okay, so I think the, com the institute is going to share this documentation with you guys. So this is the entire course content actually. Okay, we'll be starting from the very basics, virtualization, networking basics, Linux commands and all. And then we go into the advanced concepts as well. Okay, courses for a duration of 35 to 40 days, right? Where we have classes from Monday to Friday every day for one hour each. And the time slot that has been fixed by the institute right now is 9 a.m. 9 a.m. in the morning. Okay, every day. But... If you need an evening batch, we'll be arranging an evening batch as well shortly. So there's a running batch right now in the evening slot at 7 p.m., I suppose. That should be ending in a few days, maybe 10 days or so. And after that, there'll be an evening batch as well. But right now, the open slot right now is 9, 9 a.m. in the morning from tomorrow onwards. So tomorrow will be the first class where we talk about networking fundamentals. What are IP addresses? Oh, just to give you a glimpse of the data will learn in the next session. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. So when the evening batch will start, sir? Uh, there's a running batch right now at 7 p.m., uh, guys. So it should be starting by, I would say, more, 10 more days. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So probably by 5th, I would say. Okay, okay. because we'll be done with that by 2nd. So we'll hold a demo on 4th. And then from 5th onwards, we'll have a 7 p.m. batch. Okay, right now the ongoing empty slot is at 9 a.m. in the morning. So there's a new 9 a.m. batch running from tomorrow. So that's the slot from tomorrow. From 5th again, two weeks after, we'll have an evening 7 p.m. batch as well. Okay, but yeah, the institute will confirm the dates to you guys. On a rough estimate, I'm saying 5th of uh, next month. Okay, is that clear? Okay. Moving back, as mentioned, guys, so these are all the topics we'll be covering in the upcoming days. And in tomorrow's session, we're going to talk about networking fundamentals. Okay. What are IP addresses? Okay. What is the range of IP? How do you convert any binary number to a decimal number? Okay. What is the first IP? What is the last IP? What is the range of IP? What are the categories of IPs? Classes, public IPs, private IPs. Okay. Categories. What is a DHCP server? What is a DNS server? We'll talk about all these in the upcoming sessions. Okay. So from Monday to Thursday or Friday also, we'll be having demos itself. Right? So these networking sessions will be taken as demo classes as well. So you can join those sessions for free. Okay. So you don't need to make any payments for the first few classes. After that, if you're interested to continue the course, you can register with the Institute directly. Okay. So these are the topics we'll be learning in the upcoming sessions in the next one or two sessions. Okay. 
So yeah, again, as mentioned, every single class will be recorded. You will be getting these sessions as recordings as well. First few will be uploaded on YouTube itself. But after that, once the registrations are complete, you'll be getting it directly on your email. You'll be getting these presentation slides. You'll be getting the documentation. You'll be getting the recordings. You'll be getting the bonus content all on your emails directly. Okay. And uh, anything else that I'm missing out on? Mm, 35 days course, one hour every day. And yeah, Monday to Friday, one hour class. That's that. Nothing further for our session today, guys. If you have any questions, we can have a small Q&A session now for any queries or doubts. Sir, I'm completely new to this field. Actually, I'm a computer science graduate, nothing to do with cybersecurity. Will I be able to like uh, understand this course or do we need any prerequisite for this specifically? Not at all required. Uh, Hafiza, right, was asking the question. Uh, yeah, Malika. Yeah. Yeah, again, as I I mentioned this in the beginning of the class as well. Uh, no, no requirement for any prerequisite at all because all the prerequisites are included in the course itself. So what you require is some knowledge on networking and Linux commands. But since people might be joining from other backgrounds, non-technical backgrounds as well, we have made designed the course in as simple format as possible. So all the prerequisites are already included. So you have to worry about nothing else. Okay. Oh, I think she exit the session but uh, okay no again just to answer guys as mentioned no prerequisites required at all okay so all the prerequisites are included in the course okay networking fundamentals linux commands how do you set up the environment okay how do you uh, again how do you have a practical lab setup we'll learn every single thing in the course itself so we'll have a practical lab setup i'll show you how to install the lab as well. there's a separate class for that and in that lab we'll install all the important software is required for the course okay so everything is included in the course itself any other questions guys sir for learning test tree complete question as you mentioned Oh yeah, Harshal. So yeah, web pen testing. So my expertise is in website pen testing, Harshal. So again, after CS is done, if, if students are interested in going advanced level in cybersecurity, I teach web pen testing. So again, for that information also, you can contact me on my personal number, 984998-4778. That's my number. Okay, I've shared it in the chat, guys. If you have any personal questions to ask regarding the course as well, you can contact on that number. That's my WhatsApp number. Okay. So again, but I would recommend to take up that course only after CEH is done because that's an advanced course. We will not be covering any basic important information, fundamental information. So for advanced courses, that is not taught by Durga Soft. I teach that privately. So yes, what about yes. certification? Again, if you're planning on writing certification, Rashmi, after this course is done, you can apply for the same. So again, that is provided by EC Council as mentioned. So if you go to your browser, search for EC Council, Click on the first link. The course we are learning is Certified Ethical Hacking. The first course, if you notice here. Okay. So you will be getting a course completion certificate from the institute. But if you plan on writing, this is the certification exam you can write. Okay. But again, quite a costly certification. So the last I checked, this was around $500 or so for just the exam. Okay. 40,000. Sorry. 40,000. Last time I checked, you yeah, five hundred dollars. So five hundred dollars converted roughly, I would say, I mean forty thousand or so. But again, I keep do getting some. I mean, I uh, do keep getting some uh, discount coupons and all since I have some contacts in the C council. So five hundred USD to INR. That would be around forty one or so. Okay, but again, with some discount coupons applied and all, it can come down to thirty eight, thirty seven, something like that. Okay, but and again, it's a completely MCQ question based exam. You have 125 questions, and out of those 125 questions, you have to get 75% of them right, or else you will feel the examination. Okay, but with the course we are learning, with the content I'll be sharing to you, and again, I'll be sharing some uh, uh, demo questions as well, uh, some question dumps as well. So that should be more than sufficient to crack the exam. No, no issue with that. But again, as mentioned, it's quite a costly certification. 
And usually I recommend students that if they're working in an organization, the organization can sponsor the certification to you. That would be a good thing. If you're putting your own money, it's quite risky. But as I again mentioned, you should be well prepared when you write the exam. Okay. You will be getting material to prepare. You'll be well, again, you'll be cutting all the content required. But if your preparation is not up to the mark, it's quite a heavy amount to lose. So if the company can sponsor that, it's a better option. It's a risk-free option, I would say. Okay. But again, some students do write it on their uh, own amount as well. So, but yeah, that's the criteria. 125 questions, MCQ based, and you get seven, you need to get 70 persons of percent of them right. Okay. Again, my opinion would be as mentioned, if you can get it sponsored from the company, well and good. If not, you can ignore it and you can just show your skill set in your resume. You can build your resume in such a way that you don't require the certification as well. You can show uh, uh, show your skill in such a manner. I'll show you how to do that as well in the upcoming sessions. How do you prepare your resume in such a way that you can show that you're practically skilled in this domain, okay, without the necessity of a certification. Okay. Is that clear? Ranjan Naik. Uh, uh, the certification we will get from Durga Soft will be written uh, CES certified now, as similar to that of EC Council provides. And you will be getting, yeah, CEH uh, certified ethical hacking course completion. It will not be from EC Council accredited because, again, you need to write the certification exam for that. But you will have a course completion certificate on the course certified ethical hacking itself. Uh, Harshan. Yes, sir. Right. Mm, any other questions, guys? Harshad, Bishwamitra. Bishwamitra, I hope. Uh, I could answer your question on how this might be important to you for your organization. Yes, yes. Right. Uh, yeah, that uh, advanced version, whatever you are giving. But, uh, oh, yeah. That is for web pay interesting, Bishwa. So if you're planning on doing that, you can contact separately. But again, as mentioned, the prerequisite for that course is the first one, Certified Ethical Hacking. So I would like to... Whatever you are giving right now. Yeah, the one, the one we have taken right now. The demo for... Okay, okay. That is but, uh, what is the course fee for that, uh, whatever you are giving the person? This is uh, the certified ethical hacking from Durga. So, this is 8,000 rupees. Vishwa. This is 8,000, but uh, after that, the advanced person. Oh, that you would have to contact me separately, privately for that. I have dropped my number okay. in the chat. So, if you want information regarding that, any data on that, you can contact me privately. Okay. okay. Right. Uh, any other questions? Hush. There is one to one training. No? That will be one to one training. Again, that is also on the format of a batch itself, Vishwa. I'll be teaching for all the students who join. Okay, So I'll form a batch if, uh, with the interested students. I'll uh, start the batch over the weekends. All right. Any other questions? Rashmi, Pulak, Faisal, Malika, Harshad, Vishwamitra. Yes, okay. As in no questions, guys, we can end the session over here. And please do join the session tomorrow. If you're available at that time slot, 9 a.m. As mentioned, tomorrow we'll have the first session on networking fundamentals. Anyone here who's specifically looking for a different time slot, guys? Vishwamitra, Harshad, Malika, Faisal, Pulak, Rashmi. Anyone so I need the evening batch. Oh, you need the evening batch after 7 after seven at shop. So Bishwamitra and Hashrad is evening. Oh, Pulak is also evening. Malika, Faisal, Rashmi, you three are good for morning batch. So both are fine. Here. Anything, anything is, is fine. fine. Achha, achha, anything is fine. Okay, sure. I'll, con I'll confirm with the institute as well, guys. I can, I'll try to check if there is any possible other time slot available. But if not, for now, as mentioned, from tomorrow, we'll have a 9 a.m. slot. Okay. And in a few, in one or two weeks, again, I'll have an evening batch as well. So we can join that as well. Okay. So, yeah, we'll see how it goes accordingly, guys. But thanks for joining the session today. It was great interacting with all of you. Thank you. I hope I didn't bore you out. And I hope I kept the uh, session interesting. And, uh, yeah, that's that. Have a good day. Have a good Sunday. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, sir. Bye.